here in a minute, but I'm going to talk about this. In continuing our Old Testament survey, we're in Daniel. The theme of the book of Daniel, understand this, is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. That's uh, all 12 chapters deal with unbelievable levels of the sovereignty of God. Daniel 5.21 is the signature verse of the book, and it captures that reality. It says, the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. <clears throat> three different visions are given to Daniel, uh, and in all three, they all three say the same thing, and that is that there would be four consecutive world powers that would rise up, and there's different uh, metaphors or animals, uh, in two of our animals. Anyway, different metaphors for what those empires are. The first one was the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, so you had the Persian Empire, and then the Persians were conquered by the Greeks, and that became the Greek Empire. And then the Greeks were conquered by Romans. the Romans. And that's those are the four, and they that covered a span of about 500 years-ish. <clears throat> and so David, Daniel gets three visions, and that declares the sovereignty of God because it shows that God rises, raises up and he tears down. He puts people in power, and he removes them. Um, this is also the book where God rescues Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. It's where Daniel is rescued from the lion's den. Uh, and in chapter 7, in, in, in concert with the sovereignty of God being its theme, we get a little glimpse. Um, and this is the first time up to this book. This would be the first time in the Bible that we get a glimpse. Uh, well, Job has a little bit. But you really get to see the inner workings of how God issues decrees from heaven. And I think that's very important because how I pray sometimes is, uh, we'll pray in accordance with what chapter 7 says about how God basically raises the gavel and says, Thus saith the Lord, and boom, that's what's going to happen. Um, our passage, I, 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 it picks up, our passage picks up right in the middle of a story. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has had a dream that deeply disturbed him. It is so disturbing that when he calls his wise men and sorcerers to interpret it, he refuses to tell them what the dream is. In order to not just something made up by the wise men, he wants them to tell him what he dreamed. So he wants them, you tell me what the dream is, and then give me the interpretation. Uh, and this absolutely, uh, infuri well, the, the wise men say no, nobody can do that. And that infuriates Nebuchadnezzar, and that's where our text picks up at verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the, so the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. By the way, those three names is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they were renamed by the Babylonians after they were captured. Anyway, he urged them to plead for mercy from, God, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and, and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Um, then, of course, after he becomes infuriated, as our text says, he orders the execution of all the wise men. Those wise men would, anybody that, they were sorcerers, they were diviners, diviners, whatever they were called, uh, people who, who were experts in uh, uh, sorcery and stuff like that, and also people very well learned in philosophy and being able to give deep philosophical answers and stuff like that. So 
So he orders the execution. Of course, Daniel and his friends were not a present in the king's uh, throne room when the wise men came to be asked to tell the king, this is what your dream is, and to reinterpret it. So they weren't there. They weren't in the room. I want us to understand something about the wise men and King Nebuchadnezzar. They both represent the lost in our world. Now, I preached a sermon back in March about the book of, out of the book of Esther that uh, <clears throat> was along a similar line. Uh, but the context of our passage is, is different, and it teaches us some different things uh, about the lost and about our inter interaction with the lost. I want us to notice what happens here. I want us to notice what God does here. God brings King Nebuchadnezzar to a place where he wants and needs to see the miraculous. He wants and needs to see the miraculous. He is no longer content to just go along in the usual function of life. God gives the king a dream that is, so, that is profoundly disturbing. It is believed that the main reason why... <clears throat> The dream was so disturbing because the dream is this. In essence, it's, I'm going to give you the short version of it. Uh, he sees a statue. And he's pretty much everybody believes that he sees his face. The statue is a statue of him. A boulder is thrown at the statue and absolutely, completely destroys it and turns it to dust. So... <laughs> It's believed that the, the reason why he was so disturbed by the vision, by the dream, is because he sees himself being destroyed. If you and I had a waking dream where we see a statue of ourselves being utterly destroyed, we might want to know for sure what it meant as well, right? Uh, no fudging it. I've said this before, but the miraculous is not optional to the proclamation of the gospel. If it was necessary for Christ in the early church, then it is necessary for us. And multiple times in the Old Testament, you see the same thing. The proclamation of the gospel was accompanied by the miraculous. One of them that, we may not look at it this way, but if you look at the um, deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, there were ten plagues, and then the parting of the Red Sea down to dry land, and then the drowning of the Egyptian army. Did that not speak very loudly to the people of Egypt that God is God? Yeah. It did. It was miraculous. Um, I want us to see that both King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men were in need of the miraculous. The king needed it in order to be sure what his dream meant. And the wise men needed it in order to save their lives. <laughs> Understand that one of the ways that God works in the hearts of the lost is to put them in a place where they need the miraculous. In the case of King Nebuchadnezzar, it was... Because he was no longer to go blithely along with, within the confines of the usual understanding of things. And he has to be certain that the wise men are telling him the truth and not just making something up. God upsets his apple cart in such a way that he needs to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the truth is about his dream. He has been brought to a place where just accepting the status quo of what is understood as truth from his wise men is no longer acceptable to him. <clears throat> Has anybody here been praying for someone's salvation? Good. I didn't hear that. Um, understand that God will most likely bring them to a place where they can no longer just accept the false philosophies of this world and of the deception of their own hearts. He, they will start to look around and wonder what the real truth is. Have you ever run into somebody... That you, you can see the conviction of the Holy Spirit to fall on them. They're just like, okay, I want to know what the real truth is. I'm tired of this. There's all these religions in the world. And there's all these questions. I want to know that I know that I know that I know. That is a work of God. <clears throat> and in that moment, they will no longer be comfor comfortable. They're going to want to know that they know that they know what the real truth is. On the other side, you have the wise men, and they're in a little bit different situation. They are defiant and rejecting of the idea that they could, or anyone else could, tell the king what his dream was and then interpret it. 
They're trying to give the king a wake-up call and get him to see that it isn't just, this isn't the way things work. Have you ever ran into people who don't know God and they're defiant and rejecting? Notice what happens here. Notice what happens here. The miraculous is for them as well. And they are confronted with the truth of God's reality and their lives are saved. Uh, despite the fact that they're defiant, I think that unfortunately, well, probably about half the people out there that don't know Christ are defiant. Uh, only God knows. <clears throat> They are saved, hear me when I say this, they are saved when the miraculous is released. And so it is with King Nebuchadnezzar. If you have your Bibles, just look over at the, the end of chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, to take a look at what happens to Nebuchadnezzar after Daniel tells him what his dream is and then interprets it. Listen to what he says, verses 46 and 47. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, get this, this is the king of kings. I mean, this guy's a king over king. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate. Uh, before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and, in, uh, uh, and incense be presented to him the king said to Daniel here's a confession, listen to this surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery King Nebuchadnezzar falls on his knees and acknowledges that Daniel's God is the God this ties in with what it says in the book of Revelation in chapter 3. And understand this principle. Revelation chapter 3 is a portion. Chapter 3, verse 9, we get a little snapshot out of the letter to the, the church of Philadelphia from Jesus Christ. And this is what it says. This is what Christ is saying to the church of Philadelphia. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And this is a principle of scripture. The repentance of someone before Christ is not just a repentance before God. It's an acknowledgement to you that you are right. One of the, let me just, I don't have time to segue into this too deeply, but let me just say it this way. God really does want and is the target goal for what we should do. Let me back up. Let me back up. How many here have ever stuck your mouth, foot in your mouth, trying to witness to someone? Okay. What's that? Yes. I know. If you've been a Christian for, for very long, there's you're probably going to do that. Let me tell you what the principle of Scripture is. You are to pray people into the kingdom. The final step of that process is what? God will maybe let you share the gospel with them. And in, in some situations, you're just going to plant the seed, or maybe you're the waterer of the seed. But the final step, the final step, don't stick your foot in your mouth until God opens the door. And let me tell you something, when God opens the door, you're going to know that you know that you know that God has opened the door. Don't try to kick the door down. Don't try and put your foot in it. Don't try to oversell. The salvation of a soul is a miraculous function and it requires a miraculous function from the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot, hear me when I say this, convince anyone to get saved. Unless the Holy Spirit is at work. Right. So you never want to open your mouth. How many times have I seen it where somebody, they get defiant. I used to have this happen when I worked. Uh, they, they become obnoxious jerks and they go around like a pie in the face and throw the gospel in people's face. Are they praying for those people? No. They're just arrogant and defiant and they do great damage to the gospel. Why? Because they didn't pray the person into the kingdom. They're trying to hard sell them into the kingdom. It's not going to work. Anyway. God wants a person to be prayed to a point where they not only kneel and bow before God and confess their sins and say, yes, I'm a sinner, but they acknowledge to you that you were right. <clears throat> I want us to notice something here. Daniel and his three friends were placed in a crisis by God 
in order for God to be revealed to the king and to the wise men. And it wasn't just some minor crisis. <clears throat> Their lives were on the line. It also was for the purpose of promoting them because they, all four of them got promoted out of this. But first and foremost, it was for the purpose of revealing God to the lost. God placed the four of them under the threat of being executed so that the king and the wise men might come to know him. Think about that. We need to realize something. Everything in Scripture, everything in our Christian life, and I can go on beyond it and say it this way. Everything in history is about reaching the lost. Everything that God is, everything that Scripture is, is about reaching the lost. Sometimes we forget that. Think about it. How important is it to God to reach the lost? Think about that. How important? Very important. Infinitely important. God sent his only son to die for the world. The Godhead suffered three unimaginable things. Things that we can't imagine because we're in the cesspool down here. And so it's hard for us to relate to this. But here, the, these three things that the Godhead suffered. The sin of the world, the whole world of all time and history was placed on the Christ. The Godhead had never experienced sin. We're sinners, so we can't really relate to that. <clears throat> Christ was separated from God the Father and God the, the Holy Spirit. Well, by nature, we're fallen creatures, and we tend to separate ourselves from people just by nature. Hard for us to understand that. Christ died. The Godhead had never experienced death. Death is a part of society. Death is a part of nature. And so we don't understand it. All of this sacrifice and suffering happened in order to bring the lost to salvation. Do not forget that. If God threw his own son under the bus, how infinitely important do you think it is to him to make sure that that blood covers as many sinners as possible? There are not words to adequately declare how important the reaching of the lost is to the Almighty God. For most Christians, the understanding of this is inadequate. Most Christians define the Christi Christianity around coming to church. But becoming, but becoming a Christian is no less of a commitment than joining the military. When you join the military, you have now an obligation to fulfill a mission. Missions. <clears throat> but the big picture mission is to defend the country. Uh, and God has a mission for us. And that is the reaching of the lost in our world. It needs to have the all same all-consuming priority in our lives that it does in God's. <clears throat> We need to understand that just like being in the military, God may put our lives on the line in order to accomplish the mission because it is infinitely important to him. I want to say something that's maybe a little sobering. I'm not going to fill the blanks too much. Are we... Sometimes I question why God removes people that are his. And sometimes, sometimes, and I'm not referencing to this church right at the moment, I'm thinking of this. Because they're not involved in the mission. God takes them out. Just think about it. We're, is it a priority in our lives? Are we involved in the mission? Look, if you're a Christian, you have to understand the all consuming passion of God to reach the lost. Amen. It is everything. It is all in all from Genesis to Revelation. Every aspect of Scripture is pointed at that. Do we have things in our lives that we desperately want from God? That we want God to answer prayers? Do we? Amen. I hope so. That should be a part of your Christian walk. We should all have something. At least one. Understand something. It needs to be that we tie that to the reaching of the lost. I'm just going to kind of cut to the quick here and, and help us to understand something. I've said this before, but it bears a lot of repeating. And that is... Answers to prayer and the miraculous are about reaching the lost. Amen. There can be a construct and a, and, a, and a concept in our heads and our thinking. We got the four walls of the church. God come bless us here. And God says, no! 
Come heal us. No! Why? It has to be tied to the reason of the loss. Is there a lost soul that's going to come into Christ because of this healing? Is there a lost soul that's going to come to Christ because of this help that you need in some way in your life? So what I'm telling you is that whenever you're praying for something, tie it to the loss. Tie it to the loss. Tie it. Whenever I pray, a lot of times when I pray, you can, many of you have heard me pray. Lord, may you heal so-and-so, and may the testimony from that healing bring lost souls to Christ. I'm tying the healing to the salvation of the lost. Amen. Amen. God listens to those kinds of prayers. Amen. The Church of Jesus Christ is never supposed to be a bless me club that stays well confined within its own four walls and doesn't worry about the world around or just points its finger and wags its finger and says, well, bless God, they're just a bunch of sinners. They're going to hell, you know. Whatever. That's not Christ, and that's not Christian. If that is not God's concept, I'll tell you that right now. <clears throat> Do we have a healing need? Do we have a financial need? Tie it to the lost. Do we have a, some other kind of a need? Tie it to the lost. God tends to raise the sick, <laughs> raise the sick, heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out the demons. In order to bring the lost to Christ. When Christ was out healing the sick, raising the dead, and casting out the demons, it was for the purpose of the proclamation of the gospel. They opened the door. Now those people are paying attention. Remember that. We, God wants to be powerful in our world, but it has to be tied to the lost. The church is about reaching the lost. Our lives as Christians are tied singularly to the reaching of the lost. Everything that is God, everything that is in Scripture, everything that is miraculous is about reaching the lost. I also want to point to the importance of prayer here. Not like I haven't ever taught on that before. <laughs> Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were people of prayer. Everyone has said this. If they hadn't been, they would have died. Sure. Arioch would have taken the sword and plunged it into their chest or cut their throats. Daniel was able to say to Arioch, the man whom the king had sent to execute them, that they needed a little time to pray in order to know what the dream was and what its interpretation was. He was then, hear me when I say this, able to come back to meet up and meet up with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and ask them to pull out all the stops in prayer so that God would reveal to him the dream. What would it have looked like if Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not been people of prayer. Well, there would have been a lot of blood on the floor. That's what it would have been. Understand something. God is serious about reaching the lost. He's serious. I, I, I'm not going to take this and move it too far down the line, but let me say something. Sometimes the reasons why you and I are experiencing crises in our lives is because God has a crosshair on some lost soul. Amen. And he's going to use you in whatever way he possibly can. Your soul's already saved. And he's going to use you. We need to be on board with that. Amen. Amen. And understand how deep and how broad and how wide and how passionate God is about reaching the lost. He'll do whatever he wants to do. And dare I say this, he'll do whatever he wants to do to me or to you to reach the lost. We need to be on board with that. If we're not on board with that, if we don't, don't have that in our concept, in our construct... We can get ran over. The time to discover that you need to be a person of prayer is not at the point of crisis. I have said this before. A crisis will reveal where your prayer life is. A crisis will show whether or not we have built a temple of prayer. A crisis will expose whether or not we are in sync with God. A crisis will reveal whether or not we are in unity with our fellow believers. Also note that Daniel goes to his house to pray. His place of prayer was in his house. That's what verse 17 says. Do we have a place of prayer in our houses, in our homes? I'll say it again. A crisis is the wrong time to discover that we need to build a temple of prayer. <coughs> Let me also say this. It's not a matter of you and I facing a crisis. We're all going to face a crisis. We've faced it before. We're going to face it again. You don't want to discover in that moment that you're not a person of prayer. And here's the biggie, that there's not a cadre of people around you who are people of prayer. Right. 
That's the wrong time. This reminds me of Christ's parable of the ten virgins. How many? Remember that one? Ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five of them had extra oil for their lamps and five didn't. And that oil represents prayer, by the way. I don't have time to preach that. When the bridegroom showed up, the five wise virgins went with him. The bridegroom was Christ. The other five were locked out because they didn't have any oil. And how that parable ends is pretty bold. It says, and they will be cast out into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's how that parable ends, by the way. Which category do you and I fall into? Daniel and the other three demonstrate that they were wise, that they were people of prayer. It is quite extraordinary when you think about it. Think about it. Think about it. They were so in tune with God and with each other that they birthed a miraculous revelation in one night. It's not a matter of whether you and I are going to face a crisis. I said that a minute ago. We will all face one at one time or another. The question is whether or not we are people of prayer. So we have two ways that we need to apply this. First, are we praying about our needs and burdens and tying them to the praying for the lost? Secondly, are we headed for a major crisis without being people of prayer? Without extra oil in our lamps? Daniel receives the revelation from God in the night. And that night of revelation gives way to a morning of rejoicing. I love this verse, Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen. I want us to see that a night of prayer I have no doubt included weeping. All four of them. Gives birth to a revelation, a miraculous revelation, a miraculous image. Again, let us understand that it was a night of laboring in prayer that gave way to the revelation that saved their lives. I have been laboring in prayer for someone's salvation. And the Lord gave me, and I think it, it's just basic stuff, I suppose you could say, but for me it's miraculous. The Lord said, here's how I want you to pray for this person. You know what he said? And that Once again, this revelation came out of laboring in prayer. The Lord said, pray. For their best friend to get saved. Because when the best friend gets saved, what's going to happen? Amen. I never, that totally blew me out of the water. I was like, wow, okay. <clears throat> Is there a revelation that God wants to give us that will solve our problems? Is there a revelation not given to us because we didn't labor in prayer? Think about it. Daniel and his three friends were saved because of a revelation from God, not because he sent an army or an angel in there or because God just beamed them out. No, it came through a revelation. And that revelation was birthed, hear me when I say this, through the agreeing in, the, in prayer of the four. Matthew 18, 19, I love this verse. There's others like it in Scripture, uh, but I like this one, my favorite, uh, on this topic. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I tell you, this is Christ speaking. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by your Father in heaven. Well, you can double that to four, or four of them. Um, and Daniel and his friends weren't just people of prayer. They were people in agreement in prayer. <clears throat> and guess what? It takes time for a group of people to really start agreeing in prayer. That word agree in Matthew has a very dynamic meaning. It means that it goes to the very core of their souls. Let me tell you something. This is what God wants. He wants there to be an agreeing in right. prayer. Right. And what does that agreeing mean? Once again, this is another sermon, but I'm just going to glancing blow give it here. That agreeing means that literally your burden becomes mine. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Amen. Yours. Yeah. Right. That I feel as deeply about my, my fellow believer's burden 
as they did. Yeah. Even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, my bird that they I wish you were living here. I know it's sick. I only have time to give one example. There are many. I remember calling up Dave late at night. I said, my son's in real trouble. Dave sobbed Thank you. because my burden has become his uh -huh. Uh -huh. and he and I and we're not the only ones that have time to go into it all we fight for each other's families and for yeah. each other's burdens Dave sobbed that's a green amen Yes, we need to pray by ourselves. That's what establishing a temple of prayer is. Amen. By yourself, and then you come and you agree Amen. with fellow believers. Thank you, Jesus. It took 10 days of nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so to speak, prayer for the 120 to birth the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In order to achieve that, we have to be meeting together on a regular basis and praying together. After a while, there will come a unity in prayer that goes to the very core of your souls. And oh, by the way, that's what we do on Wednesdays. Amen. That's what's happening. Let me tell you something. Absolutely, positively, with my hand up before heaven, on God's word, we are about to experience the miraculous intervention at least amongst the cadre that show up here. Why? Because the burdens have gone deep and we are bearing each other's burdens. And ahead of myself, but thusly we're fulfilling the law of Christ. When you bear one another's burdens, when their burden becomes as important to you as it is to them, and even more so, that's what agreement is. We fight each other's battles, that's called agreement. I would encourage you to be here. Amen. Because it's about to explode. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to miss it. No. Now, I know some of us can't be there. I get that. Most of us probably can't be there. I get that. But I encourage you. I encourage you to be involved. Amen. God will honor our prayers as we pray by ourselves in our own prayers of temple. Temple of prayer. Yes. But the principle of Scripture is what? Where two or three agree. Now, let me just say something. I read Matthew 18, 19, my, my favorite verse on this. Did you notice that there's no sticking points? There's no exceptions. There's no nothing. This is the one time in Scripture, it's multiple times, but this is the one time in Scripture where God says... If you are agreeing with each other, I will do it. Amen. Amen. There is no, well, you know, maybe not, blah, 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 blah. If you go, we got to have these uh, boxes checked off. No, 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 no. It doesn't just say it in Matthew there. It says it again in Matthew later on. And then I think it says it in Mark and then it says it in Luke. It might say it in John. Where two or three agree, they are bearing one another's burdens to the core. God says, I will do it. Amen. In verses 20 through 23, God praises, Daniel praises God. In verse 20, I like this. It's kind of a, what they call an inclusion. I'm not going to get into that. But in verse 20 it says, Daniel declares, Wisdom and power are yours, O God. And then in verse 23 he says, You have given me, given me wisdom and power. The prayer meeting took
took the wisdom and power of God and gave it to Dan. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to take his wisdom and power and make it ours. He wants that wisdom and power to reach the lost. He wants it to proclaim the gospel. Let's take note that it was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men that God was the supreme ruler of all things, which is what verses, well, the dream itself says that, and then Daniel's praise says that. And that revelation, hear me when I say this, came through a crisis and a prayer meeting of God's people. Are we taking the crisis, combining with other believers, tying it to the lost? Uh, and then be somebody else's yeah. burden and making that our own. Amen. Yeah. I want us to note that Daniel praises God here. He praises God, and get this, he praises God even before he presents the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He's already praising God. He's already praising God. <laughs> I want us to note that we see the three elements of prayer here. We see the word, we see worship. And we see warfare. All three of them are there. Once again, let me just say it again. A little off topic. Maybe I'm not really off topic. But our personal prayer lives is where our spirituality begins. It's the core and it's the essence of our spirituality and of our Christianity and of our relationship to God. We take the word, the worship, and the warfare that we do privately. We bring it into the public. It becomes communal. And we start bearing one of those burdens. And God starts answering prayer. Amen. There you go. <clears throat> um, once again, let us realize that all four of these men were men of prayer. They were no doubt engaging in prayer all the time. We see that in Daniel's life, which it reflects it in the book of Daniel, that he repeatedly was always in prayer by himself. But by extension, we know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were as well. <clears throat> So when we have these four men come together in agreement in prayer, God powerfully answers. Amen. And the same thing will happen for us if we engage in the biblical teachings on prayer. Yeah. I want us to take a look at verse 22 as we move on here. Almost done. Verse 22 says this. Listen to it. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. One of the things that this verse teaches us and shows us, hear me when I say this, you and I can't see anything unless there's an external light. The sight's not on, if there's no sun outside, no stars, no moon, no light. You, I don't care how good your sight is, you still cannot see anything. God has to be there to illuminate things for us to see it. We are dependent on that. Amen. And the same thing is true spiritually. You know, I'm, I'm applying this spiritually. The lost cannot see truth unless it is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. John 8, 32, one of my favorite verses. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. Let me tell you something. How many people in our, how many lost people in our world know the truth? A lot. They've been exposed to it. It's not as much as it used to be, but they've been exposed to it. But it hasn't set them free, has it? No. That's because there needs to be an illumination. They have to see it. It's one thing to know the truth, it's quite another thing for, for it to set you free. Our job is to birth into the lost the revelation of the truth so that it will set them free. Daniel and his friends birthed the revelation of the truth into King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men. And that was a supernatural function. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Amen. Yes. The veil of darkness is removed. How many here have ever led someone to Christ? I happen to good. I happen to be among the ones that has never done it. Isn't that crazy? Oh, I've done a lot of seed planting. <laughs> and I've done a lot of watering. But God usually doesn't have me do the I'm never there for the final. I hear about it. I get to hear about it. I remember I my, my very first boss, when I first went to work at the base, my very first boss, prayed for his salvation, gave him a Bible, and was a witness. I worked for him for 10 years. 
What happened? He moved to Florida, and then I get a report back. Praise the Lord, I just became a Christian. Hallelujah. That's fantastic, but I wasn't involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the harvest. But we're called to plant seeds, we're called to water, and then somebody's going to harvest it. Um, remember this, everything in life is temporary. That's right. Except salvation. The only thing that matters. Eternity is forever. We need to have the same passion and urgency that God has for the lost. We need to have the same brokenness over the lost that Christ had. Christ was so brokenhearted and so passionate over the lost that he went all the way to the cross and died. That's right. Um, you know, this, is, this is an Easter. I'm going to make a little segue into Easter here for just a moment. Think about the level of passion and brokenheartedness and faith that it took for Christ to cross the threshold of death. The Father and the Spirit had turned their back on him. No longer in communion with him. Because he has a sin of the world on him. And he's crossing that threshold of death. In faith that somehow he's not going to end up in eternal damnation himself. Think about that. That's an enormous amount of faith. But that's an enormous amount of broken heartedness and an enormous amount of passion for the lost. He crossed right across the threshold of death with all the sin of the world on him, and he did it in faith. And he did it because of passion and broken heart of his. Amen. I want us to see that this revelation of the dream was a form of the gospel. Because of the revelation, King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men are saved. The wise men are saved physically, but I've said this before, let me just say something. The word salvation in Scripture does not differentiate. We differentiate. Salvation is salvation is salvation of every type and strength. Amen. The Hebrew words, uh, the Aramaic words, the Greek words. For salvation is every type, which is one of the reasons why I always have said this before. It's one of the reasons why I say that the miraculous needs to be a part of the gospel because it needs to be the full gospel because there needs to be healing and deliverance as well because the Bible does not compartmentalize it. All right, after that. The revelation becomes the thing, the supernatural revelation that brings King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men to, to salvation. When we examine the book of Daniel, we see God growing Daniel's understanding and wisdom. In the front of the book, Daniel interprets somebody else's dream twice, which was Nebuchadnezzar. This is the first one. And it interprets somebody else's dream. Then he has... Two of his own dreams that he then has to interpret, which he does, or they're interpreted for him by angels and him. And then, these are dreams, but notice the progression. And then, towards the end of the book, there are two straight up, literally like me standing here, angelic visits in which the angels come and they have a rather lengthy conversation with him. Notice the progression. Notice the progression. It starts with someone else's dreams, then it moves to having him having his own dreams, and then it has full-on angelic visits. What can we learn from this? It tells us that we need to follow the same path and become more and more adept at sharing the gospel. The revelation of the gospel needs to become more and more sharp in our mouths as a sword. I have found that the more that I pray for the lost, the more God uses me as a witness. How many have ever been scared? Think of it. God used me as a witness. Hear me when I say this. I, I have known of no exception to this. Both for myself or anyone else. If you're praying for the lost, you will witness and you probably won't realize you did it. That's right. If you're not praying for the lost, your hands are going to turn sweaty. Mm -hmm. You're going to get nervous. Your heartbeat's going to go through the roof and you're going to stumble all over yourself. Mm -hmm. Pray for the lost. The Lord will pour it out of you. You'll turn around and say, whoa, I guess I did share the gospel. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. There will be no scaredness. Now, it can't happen that way. It can. It can. You'll realize you have an open door. You have been praying. And sometimes you do get a little nervous. But most of the time not. I mean, I, I've known of no exceptions. I'm sure I've heard other people um, talk about it. But at the same time, I don't know if they were praying. So I can't say for sure. Uh, if you're a person of prayer and you're praying for someone who's lost, God sees that, 
And a lot of times he's going to use that. If you're not tired, God doesn't call us to reach everybody. He calls us to reach the people that he's placed a burden on our heart for. That's right. But that is representative of the whole world. Um, yeah, much to be said that way. So I want to... Um, I want us to look at verse 23. It's the last verse in our passage. Very important, beautiful verse. Love this verse. Oh, I love this verse. It just thrills my heart, fills me with joy. I'm going to read it again. This is how Daniel ends his prayer, his praise. It says, I thank you. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known, well, made known to us the dream of the king. Now I'm going to read it again. And this time I want you to pay very close attention to the unity. To, to the unity. The unity in prayer. Pay very close attention. See if you can pick up on it. Watch the progression. It moves throughout this verse. The progression. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. You see the progression? Amen. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. The other three were praying for Daniel to receive the revelation. They didn't receive the revelation. He did. But it was a group effort. And if it hadn't been a group effort, we wouldn't have this story. They, were, they took up his burden as though it was their own. In some ways because it was because they're going to get killed too. But at the same time, they're not the ones going to receive the revelation. They're praying that Daniel receives it. Think about that. <sighs> oh God Almighty, you have given wisdom to me, but it was because of the us and the we that we received. They said it another way. Daniel would have never been given the wisdom that he needed if he had not been bonded in unified prayer with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Or two Lord. or three. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What prayers remain unanswered in our lives because we have not bonded with our fellow believers in prayer? What souls have not been reached because we Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. have not shared our burden for them with others? Once again, this is what we do on Wednesdays. We share one another's burdens. Yeah. Amen. Big time. Hallelujah. You know, I talked about beating, beating you up in prayer. It's probably a terrible metaphor. <laughs> no, that's what I'm, what I'm talking about is the fact that we're going to take up your burden. We're going to take up your cause. Your burden is going to become our burden. And we're going to fight it with the, fero the same ferocity or the same level of passion that you feel it. And probably a little bit more. We're going to add about 10% to that. <clears throat> One of the things I know that I know that I know, I said this on the front end, and I'm going to end it this way. God is about to answer on Wednesdays. Amen. That's right. Amen. I can feel it coming. Amen. Amen. Because there is unified prayer. Yeah. There is agreeing. Amen. God created a crisis for King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men. But he also created a crisis for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He brought them together in unified prayer. Amen. And that unified prayer birthed a miraculous revelation that saved the king and the wise men. Amen. Everything about scripture and about God is about reaching the lost. Do we share that passion? Understand that God's miracles are about reaching the lost. That's right. Tie your need, whatever it is, to the lost. And if you say, I don't know how to do that, that's fine. You come on Wednesdays, we'll work it out. But even if not, ask God. He'll give you it. He'll show you. It's right here. This is how you can do it. Right here. The Godhead suffered unimaginable things so as to bring the loss to him. We need to have the same passion. We need to be people of prayer. We need to be people of bonded and unified prayer. And I said this before, but hear me say it again. Scripture guarantees that where there are at least two or three in total agreement that God will answer. Amen. A crisis is meant to demonstrate the soundness and worthiness of a Christian's prayer life. 
It is not meant to expose its failure. The miraculous occurs here and brings deliverance to Daniel and his friends and salvation to the king and the wise men. All of the miracles that we see, seek and all of the answered prayer that we long for must be tied to the reaching of the lost. The miracle that delivers God's people is the same one that saves lost souls. That's what we see here. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saved. But the same, the same miracle, same miracle brings the king and the wise men in too. It's the same miracle. The second miracles, the same miracle. If you want that in your life, stand to your feet. If you want to be that person of prayer, if you want to be that person that reaches the lost, once again, none of us can do this on our own. I can't. If you want to consecrate yourself to the process of bonding together with other believers in prayer, if you want to be, if you want the Lord to test and see, and here's a biggie, because the Bible says to do this. Yes. Test me in this and see that if I will not throw open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not be able to continue this out. Test me in this. If we want to be that, we want to be those people that bond and come together and unify. I know it's self-serving in some ways, but Wednesday just naturally comes to mind because we, that's what we do. We, we do a Bible study and then we bond in prayer. We do a Bible study and then we uh, agree in prayer. And that agreeing has moved Everyone I say this, to just a surfacey thing some time ago, to now, as I mentioned a little while ago, if I get one of the people to show up on Wednesdays on the phone, or I text them, Amen. the burden is there, mm -hmm. and it's deep, and it's real. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for this people. Lord, I pray for those that couldn't be here. Lord, that you would touch them and move upon the Lord. Heal, uh, continue to heal Larry, Father, healing from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Lord, we pray for those that have birthdays this week and, uh, and, and all that they do engagement. Father, we pray, Father, that you'd bless that. We pray, Father, that you would demonstrate your great love to us this week in some significant way that we know that we know that we know that you love us. I pray, Father, that your power will move. Lord, I pray, Father, that we'll be people of bonded, of green prayer. Lord, that we will bond ourselves to you in private prayer, and then that we will turn, in turn, bond ourselves to one another in a green prayer. Amen. And Lord, as we have prayed multitudes of times, especially on Wednesdays, Lord, we have a multitude of times. Lord, we have asked for your help, we have asked for your intervention, and we have tied it to the reaching of the lost. Yes, Lord. We pray, Father, now that the same miracles that we need will be the miracles that bring the lost in. And I pray that for not only for people on Wednesday, but Lord, here right now. Yes, Lord. Every need, Father, every issue, every every desire, every longing, every burden, every stressor, Lord, that is represented in this church, I pray, Father, will bring some lost soul to you, at least one. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless.